What is up, Geeky Saiyan Army? It's Kanan. It's Jesse. And we are the Geeky Saiyan Couple, of course, and today is our analysis for Ruby, Volume 8, Chapter 4. Now, this was a slightly longer episode. We're going to try and not be here too long because someone's got work to do since she is working from home. Um, and she's got to turn in tomorrow. Boy, I feel like you're in school again. <laughs> I got homework due tomorrow. Um, so before we start, I just want to say, if you enjoy the video and if you enjoy our Ruby content, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all future uploads. Hit that like button because that like button really, really, really helps the channel. And please leave a comment. We love hearing you guys' thoughts and we love interacting with you. We are getting very close, like we are we are edging up the ladder closer and closer to 400 subscribers. Let's get there very soon so we can hit that big time goal of 1,000 subscribers. And then after that happens, we'll, we'll see how things go from there, how fast it takes to keep growing after 1,000. Anyway, Chapter 4 was a lot of stuff. We had a lot of story beats. We visited a lot of characters, though we did focus the most on three specific characters, that being Yang, Jean, and Rin. A lot happened in those parts, so the episode starts with somebody laughing, and of course we learn that it is Robin, and she is telling a story Um about Joanna, who is also one of the members of the Happy Huntresses, and uh, she talks about how uh, this was the first that she had never lost a fight before that, um, and also at least not fair and square. So I wonder if she is maybe teasing toward what Joanna's semblance is. Maybe, mm. maybe I don't know. But is this Robin we're talking? About? Did Robin is Robin the only one to defeat her? Who knows? But anyway, it's pretty much Robin is telling a story to entertain Crow. Um, Probably annoy... Uh... Annoy Jacques, yeah. <laughs> and she sets up. We get our first little funny moment. And a fly is terrorizing Jacques. It's, it is, it's kind of funny. It's, it's a nice little moment to... Well, for the fact it... It's gonna stay in there with him. Yeah, <laughs> like it's it's stuck in there with him. Um, but yeah, the the main antagonist for Jacques, who is also an antagonist, is is a fly boy. If 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 I wish my troubles were that minor, that a fly was the the upsetting you. <laughs> yeah, it was upsetting me. Which um, Robin says, "Tough crowd tonight," and uh, that uh, Ironwood should have you know booked better entertainment for the cell block. I love Robin. I think she is one of the most <laughs> awesome characters. I, 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 have, I have found her attractive the moment she showed up. And Christina... Christina's... She's just got that voice. Yes. <laughs> she is just... her like, Very beautiful woman. Very attractive. Her very voice... Very talented. Very talented. Her voice is just as attractive as she is. So she gives Robin this sassy but quirky kind of she does that in her in her voices for in sailor moon as well yeah like she just it just she just brings the character like that much more to life i love this little stretch <laughs> you give it's just it's it's a mix of attractive and cute in a way um and finally, for the first time, it seems like forever, crow smirks <laughs> did and, i win <laughs> yeah like when he smirks he kind of gives like a little like that, like he does kind of find what she said uh, humorous, and you know he she yeah, says, did I win? yeah, he and he smiles. Did I win? Like she she finds it a victory in finally making him smile, uh, which he says, of course, uh, it's her game, and he doesn't make the rules. Now um, we we start getting more into heavy stuff here. Mm -hmm. Robin says she's sorry for what happened to Clover. Um, he says it's not her fault, though. I'm wondering if Robin feels a little bit of guilt because she got knocked out. Maybe she could have made a difference. Um, we've only seen Robin really fight a couple of times, and they were very short fights. I want to see Robin fight in a serious fight, because the one with her and y with, between her, Blake, and Yang, I don't really count. The one of her, Clover, and uh, Crow taking on Tyrion, it didn't last long. So... 
we've still not seen her fully fight, though. Well, Is she know, technically a fighter, though? Well, we know that she's got to have some types of skill, besides the true thing. She has to have skills to be at the top of the, you know, of where she's at with the, you know, the huntress, like the yeah. huntresses. She's the, she's the center point of it, yeah. so she's got to at least have, you know, and she's definitely skills. And she's definitely got pulled because she was running for office uh, to be a part of the council. Now, Crow says some interesting things here. He says he made a deal with the darkness. Now, in Volume 7, a lot of people took a lot of, like, had an issue with him fighting alongside Tyrion. I never really think he agreed to fight with Tyrion. It's like, he was trying to fight Tyrion in that fight, but Tyrion ma manipulated the fight. Which is what Tyrion does. Yeah, to where he ended up fighting Clover even more and more. Um, but Crow obviously feels like that he, he shouldn't have let that happen. Um, and that Clover paid the price for it. So there goes all the theories that somehow Clover was alive. Clover is indeed dead. Um... And he, you know, he says it was all happening so fast, which is true. That was a pretty fast-paced fight. We, I don't think we could even keep up with it at first. Um, saying Clover wouldn't let up, which is true. Clover just kept on attacking without even thinking. Um, and he said they could have defeated Tyrion if Clover had just not been so stubborn in following orders and had done what was really right in the end, which was bringing Tyrion down. Which kind of fits with what happens here soon. Like, Clover's not the only one. Like, yeah. I'll get to that once we reach when they enter, but... Now, this is, I think, delivers something that we all kind of knew. Crow states, the thing that really hurts about all of this, though, is that for the first time ever, he thought that maybe he could be around somebody... And because of that somebody, he could be around anyone and his semblance wouldn't make it complicated. Because what we've always known about Crow is, you know, the reason why he was always gone for so long, why he w he was an alcoholic was because his semblance, it's one of those, you know, semblances that you cannot really control. It's like, um, you know, it's a passive semblance. It has, it's got like a, a, a passive status effect in RPGs. Like if you boost your character's attack, you know, it ups their attack, even though they don't, you know, most of the time it runs out or something, where he is, you know, he causes misfortune around everybody, and C Clover had good fortune, which would balance it out, and we saw that many times in Volume 7. They became actually a pretty good duo, um, and, you know, we all theorized that Crow was probably thinking, oh, here's somebody who could, if I hung around with, I could, you know, be around anyone, my family, my friends, and I wouldn't cause anything bad for them. And sadly, that's now gone. Um, and he, At least in the mindset he's in right now. I yeah. mean, there's... I think, especially since they keep shadowing to it, he's keeping that. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. maybe it's something for him that he keep focus on that he could keep it. Himself a good luck balance. charm, maybe. Who knows? Like we we've yet to see that because he's still stuck in jail. Um, and it's obviously it just still happened. It's yeah. gonna take time, but I mean, obviously, I don't see him falling back into his old. Stuff. No, I don't I think really he will don't, either because he's growing as a character a well, lot. Well, that and they're, they're teasing a little something here in a minute that may help that, but. Uh, who knows? That's just a little theory that I'm glad Jess brought up. That maybe I don't know if uh, semblance can be put into an item, but may like maybe a um, maybe that could just help him mentally balance himself. Yeah, it was kind of like you that's know that's the only that's the only well, way it's I like to translate that. A, it, like a placebo effect in a way. Like you know, you give somebody a sugar pill and tell them that it's going to give them more energy, they'll take it, and even though it's just a sugar pill. They'll, Family Guy. Yeah, yeah. That one episode of Family Guy where <laughs> Brian tricked everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, where Brian gave everyone sugar pills and told them they were supposed to mel mellow them out, which, you know, next thing you know, they're all sitting around singing, you know, um, other country songs and all that. Um, I, I remember. I remember the name of it, but it's just I. It's not coming to into words. But maybe that's what. Maybe that's what. Uh, what. Uh, what could happen? This could be like a placebo effect. Who knows? Um, but he says, you know, it feels just like a childish dream. 
uh, and it's gone just completely. Now, here's where we get interesting. Robin says she knows what that's like. Because remember, her semblance gives her the ability to see, to tell if someone is telling the truth or not. She's a living, breathing lie detector. And um, she says being able, you know, people would be worried that, they, that she would sniff out their lies and that they tend to push you away and it makes and it makes a real connection difficult. Now when she says this, she touches the wall. Now, I don't know if they're hinting at any romance here. I still think Robin is probably a lot more younger than Crow more than likely, older than Ruby and them, but not as uh, as she old. maybe around, around winter's age. But um, I mean, then again, we've Obviously, Winter's been around Crow, so their age gap is... I don't think all of their age gap is very as big as no, you think it is. Or that they make it. I think well, Ironwood is the... Like, out of all well, of them, I think Ironwood's the oldest. I don't know, because Crow seems to be graying a little bit, so I think he is in the older category. Um, which is she why... She might just be, like, which is why behind. I, like, well, that's one of the reasons why I've never been a Winter and Crow shipper. I just think, you know... My parents were nine years apart, so... Uh, I, I don't know. I think Winter is not as old as we think she is. I think, she, I think actually, I think Miles confirmed she's either early to mid-twenties. Crow's Which not I that think old. She might be. Yeah, I'd say Crow is maybe probably late thirties, early forties. If you go in, like, when they were back in, like, school days, he's probably the, he would have been the upperclassman when she was the lower. Yeah, I don't know. You know, like, because well, Beacon I, doesn't follow four years. That's well, what I'm I know, but... At the end of the day, I don't think there's anything romantic here. I think maybe, since th this is maybe setting up that maybe Robin becomes a better sister figure to Crow than Raven has been. Who knows? I'm just guesstimating here. Cause, and it's funny. Robin is based off Robin Hood. But right now, she's kind of in the Maid Marian role. Hey, we've known characters to be in two positions. Yeah. Oh. Now... As much as I would love Snowbird, I would love Robin and Winter to be a thing. I don't think it's going to happen. I would be interested to see if they're if they set up something between her and May because May is supposed to be made Marion. So we'll see. That would be very interesting. But anyway, um, which Crow tells her he never thought of it that way. And then they finally bring Watts back, and for all his hard work, they just toss him back on the ground. There's Mero standing in the doorway just watching. And once again, Harriet is being the center of being very antagonistic, telling Crow he does not get to keep it, uh, keep Crow's, uh, Crow's, Clover's um, badge, or, you know, he's pretty much his little good luck, good luck piece, which Crow states once again he didn't kill him. And she says, you know, he keeps saying that, but it was... You know, your weapon all covered in his blood, which that's very circumstantial evidence, to tell you the truth, in a way. That's not that's not enough, really, I don't think, to convict somebody. Just because somebody. his weapon has it doesn't mean he's the one that used it. Especially when there was a convicted serial killer on, on like in the area, like the same area they were, that they were they were carrying in the ship, you know. Yeah, that's that's... There's yeah. a lot more evidence there that could point that, you know, this may be, it's foul play, but we need to look at all the variables here. So This kind of goes with, well, once she walks over to talk to Robin, what I was saying about... Um, I just love that she calls Harriet Mohawk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what but, were you saying? Um, how you were saying about Clover pretty much still just blindly following orders just mm -hmm. following orders well robin not, and being stubborn about it and then robin yeah. calls her out pretty yeah. much it's, robin pretty much offers to use her semblance to you know show that crow is telling the truth which why wouldn't you if if anyone was thinking clearly robin would be perfect to show crow's innocence but with how ironwood is being and since harriet as of right now is very antagonistic, very egocentric in a way, um, just looking for a fight. You know, she says that if she opened the, the cell, they wouldn't. it wouldn't be to hold hands. Now, right here, when she says that, Marrow finishes locking back up um, Watts, and once again, 
Marrow is not really liking how Harriet is handling the situation. He didn't like it um, when him and the others faced off against Ruby and them for the second time. And he, like, he doesn't say much in this scene, but his facial expressions tell a story. He's not liking how Harriet has, is handling things. He's not, I'm pretty sure he's not happy with how Ironwood is holding, is, uh, having things go. So more and more little soft hints of Marrow d- maybe deciding he's not where he should be. Um, or it de- this definitely isn't what he yeah. intentionally, like, initially signed up for. This yeah. They're supposed to be helping. They're not helping. They're making yeah. things worse. And Robin, I said in our reaction, this is like any time. This is in this is in re- this is in our world as much as anything else. You know, they just want someone to be mad at. They don't care about the truth right now. Um, and it's easy. And it's easier than taking an honest look at what side you're on, which does seem to get to Harriet, and she even looks at the the panel to open the cell block, and Marrow confronts her and says, you know, what are you doing? And, um, of course, she gets all broody, and she actually brushes past him, like, you know, that wasn't cool. And let's see if I can catch it. Right here. You can look at Marrow's face, and he's just like, this isn't right. This isn't the he way we should be doing not. things. It's... Yes. Um, so yeah, I really hope Mero does finally figure out that he's not where he should be very, very soon. I don't want nothing to bad happen to him because it was too late that he decided too late. But um and then Robin just brushes it off. Well, that was almost exciting, you know. Okay, so here we get to like probably the biggest part of the episode. And it is Yang, Jean, and Ren. They've chased the Hound Grim out of Mantle. As you can see, yeah, they're they are clearly out of Mantle. I'm telling you, Mantle like does not look that big from here. But then again, we're at a distance. Um, very very nice landscape. I really love now, the way it now looks. Now looking back at this, we can you can clearly tell this is just frozen over. It's not it's not land itself. Yeah. This is water. Also, I want to. I didn't pick that up the first time. But I also want to. Cl- notify here Atlas is not directly over Mantle like we thought like a not lot of more pe- yeah but was it all because look it's it's almost tethered to the ground right below the crater so if Atlas does fall it more than likely might not land on Mantle this right here it would may, cause destruction yeah it would but... cause destruction but it wouldn't land completely on now the people in the cra- all the people are in the crater so that's a definitely a big problem I still but... think that like the way that they were talking about you know it's just no it's not safe right now but we'd have everybody that we could actually we could move, having everybody in one place are easier to move than having them separated. So, I'm pretty sure that they're probably, you know, with so with uh, May with her maps and everything. Not May, um, Fiona. Fiona with her maps and everything. She's probably tr- already trying to configure what to do if something were to happen. They have to have backup plans. But we need to keep... But we just don't know that But yet. we need to keep this in mind, that Atlas is not directly over Mantle, so if it does fall, there would be some damage, but the, compl- the all of Mantle would not be crushed. So, we need to keep that in mind. So, yeah. Um, once again, another little shot from the trailer. So, we... After this episode, we have seen everything from the trailer. From here on out, we are blind. We don't know... We do not know anything that's going to happen at this point and we still got 10 episodes to go so anyway we got some back some upbeat music up uh background music that becomes a new song which sounded really amazing for this part but anyway yang jean and ren are chasing the grim into looks looks like pretty much a canyon and uh or or mountains and it's interesting in Mantle, the bike seemed fine, but now that they're out of Mantle, the it's bikes are the unstable. cold. Yeah, the cold is starting to affect the bikes. And Yang says that she really wishes one of us could fly right now. And so John takes that idea 
and pretty much uses his shield to springboard Ren up into the air, and Ren grapples onto the Hound Grim. And Ren goes for a ride. <laughs> so this was funny. This little high five between Yang and Jean, and Jean like almost out- loses it doing it. Like just another little. Just Jean. <laughs> yeah, just Jean being Jean. And poor Ren, he starts getting slammed against the mountain walls. And then Yang's like, okay, not so nice. So Jean and Yang keep on uh, following. And Jean says, uh, you know. It that notices that it's slowing the Grim down a little bit and tells Ren, Ren to hold on. And Ren's like, I kind of don't have a choice. <laughs> but um, it's funny. He st- the way he said it, like, it kind of mirrored him his old self when they'd fight. Yeah. But then, obviously we learn later, but it's just the way he said it. Well, kind of, <laughs> don't have a choice here. <laughs> and, like, he starts getting slammed over and over against rocks and all that. And we made the joke how it reminded <laughs> us of... Um, this it Looney actually Tunes is cartoon. the Robin Hood one. Yeah, the the it was the Robin. Yeah, yeah, the Donald the <laughs> Daffy Duck, da- Daffy Duck uh, Robin Hood thing where he kept on slamming against trees. Um, but anyway, Ren makes a very cool little move here. He wraps his other grappling grappling hook around a rock, and the rock's being dragged, and it does start to slow the Grim down because Yang and John start catching up to it. Um, so this was their a really good chance for them. But the Grim starts taking notice. And, you know, Yang pulls up beside it and starts firing at it because they've, they've been able to catch up to it. But what does the Grim do? Spits Oscar out of his mouth. <laughs> yep. Roars. And it summons a bunch of Grim. Not just these things from un- under the ground flying grim as well this thing can su- summon other grim and yang even notices did it just call for backup and yeah yang that's exactly what it did this place becomes almost infested with grim and we have all these shots like, you know, Jean is just riding through and slashing in each one he can it's kind of like you know um you see in like um medieval movies where a knight will ride in on the horse and just cutting enemies down and all that. Uh, and as you can see up here, a lot of flying Grim. There's Grim all over this place. Uh, and once again, I like that Kruby are making the Grim a threat again. It's really seeming like it's unbeatable odds at this point. Um, so, so they, it's, this is all a really fast-paced part, so we can't analyze every single thing. Ren does get a glimpse of Oscar, and then he starts, like, pulling himself up the cable to try and get closer. I don't know what exactly he would have done when he got I up there. I don't think it would have been good if he would have gotten up there. He wouldn't. Yeah. It probably would have cost him, or something else would have happened. So one of the centipede grim, I forgot what they're called, spits some of its toxic mucus onto John's bike and his bike starts to break down and so he stands up on his bike jumps up uses his shield you know that little bound like I don't know what it's called but the he just uses the the, the like the he pretty much rick, of it. yeah he ricochets off another one and lands on here safely and Yang picks him up just yeah throws him on pretty much. Yang is so badass in this episode <laughs> like Yang's always badass but she is really like, John may be the team leader of his team. Yang really comes off as the leader here in, in this little group. I, I, I might be, be saying that just because I'm a Yang fanboy, but um, really, really cool moment. John throws um, pretty much the little grenade. Like, it's not a grenade, but it's pretty much a, a portable shield in a way. And it deploys, and him and Yang rock it off of, and there's this cool little slow-mo of them clearing uh, all these Grim. If it wasn't such a dire moment, I'm sure Yang would have yelled out like a Yahoo yeah. or something <laughs> like that, because this is the kind of stuff she loves. And just more, gr- like, the animation here is amazing. It really is. I mean, it took him a breath, like, okay, we passed all that. Yeah. But... And everyone in the fandom is, is marveling at Yang's chest right now. Seems like... <laughs> And here we get the famous, you know, Yang's eyes going wide. And it is because 
there's a cliff. <laughs> there is no more ground there. And so they, she tries to stop, and her and Jean both go over the cliff. He tried to get his sword in the ground and grab it, but yeah. his hands just... Now, luckily, they both kept their hands uh, grasped, and Ren comes to the rescue. He grapples from Jean's sword and gets them, and it's quick thinking on Ren's part. A gr- That's not a good picture no, for Ren. Just, oh. <laughs> but a Grim comes by, and he very fast activates his semblance so they'll be covered because they're sitting ducks right now. A flying Grim could pick them off very easily right now. Like, if they if it attacked Ren, Jean and Yang would be doomed. Um, and, sadly, Ren and all... Ren, Jean and Yang have to watch the Grim fly up to Monstra. That means Oscar is sadly in Salem's possession. And, not so not only is the lamp now, but... Oscar and Ozpin now are in the abyss. They're in the belly of the well. Um, that's not good. Okay, so what about Ruby, Weiss, Blake, May, and Nora? They have went to Schnee Manor. And, of course, Whitley is there. And, you know, he tries to be shitly, as he always is. And <laughs> Weiss is not having any of it. <laughs> She uses a little bit of int- intimidation, says, shut up, let me in, I'm home. She's just pretty much move. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny here, Whitley is still defending Jacques, you know, after what you did the father. Um, Nora is still not in good shape, she's still not awake. It, it's, I never thought I'd see Blake carrying Nora. <laughs> but, um, as you can see, both Blake and uh, Ruby are worried still. Whitley is still being himself, blah, blah, blah. Now you want us to harbor fugitives, you know. And Reputation. Yeah, that's, that's, all... that's what he brings up. And even Blake calls him out, you know, that's what you're worried about right now. And um, I just want to throw this out because I kept saying it, on, saying it on Twitter. People are like, and people think Blake is straight and she kneels like this. Blake's been confirmed to be bisexual, by the way. So it, it's no longer a debate if she's straight or not. She's... It was confirmed a while ago. Um, and he he notes that all the house staff is gone, and Willow has locked herself in her room. So I was kind of hoping Willow would, like, take a power roll and maybe start taking... Well, we don't know what she's doing. Yeah, we don't. Hopefully she's... She could be going through all of, all of his stuff. Yeah, hopefully she's not in there just drinking. Um, and why starts, you know, saying, you know, get it through your head, bro... Things are not going well. You know, we're trying to save everyone, and you're just being he, a wet the, blanket. Like, even the look on his face. I mean, the thing is, is you got to think of the years that their father probably put into his mind to make him act that way. Yeah, and now but... he's starting to, like, I from the last volume, he's starting to see things slightly, but he's holding on to his status and yeah. reputation still. So it's just... Ruby, trying to be the peacemaker, says, look, we just need a place to rest while she's hurt. Well, they need a place to lay low while Nora rests, and once she's good, they'll leave. Which, Whitley actually acquiesces and says, fine, you know, what do you, you know, what do you want me to do? And Weiss pulls off the ultimate big sister move. <laughs> Go to your room. <laughs> Go to your room. Um, which is funny, because after seeing how... He tr- acted toward her in like volume four when she left. It, it's kind of fun to see her take a take her big sister role over, over again because we're so used to seeing Weiss be the younger sister to Winter. So now we get to see a little bit more of Weiss being the big sister to Whitley. So that was uh, pretty funny. So he 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 follows her. And he does what she says. He goes to his room. Um. Now, Weiss leads May off somewhere, we don't know, with Nora. I'm guessing just to a place where Nora can be put in a bed so she can rest. A bed, a couch, something, or something warm. Now, right here, I know this and a later scene, the walking animations look really fluid. Like, they've made them look, I'm not going to say that 
it's always looked stiff, but it looks way more fluid in this episode. So they must have done some motion cap here, because when Blake walks over to Ruby, it looks Ruby. Ruby looks very fluid, and I'll touch back on that again later in the episode. Now here's interesting scene number one for relationships. Um, so we are getting a lot of Blake and Ruby interaction in this volume, which is good. Everyone has always said that Ruby and Blake need to interact more. They've had the least amount of interactions within Team Ruby, though a lot a, a lot of others say it's actually Weiss and Yang who don't really interact a whole lot, but they've kind of fixed that a bit in recent volumes. Volumes 1 through 3, I would definitely say, yeah, Weiss and Yang didn't talk all that much. But thanks to, like, Volume 5, some moments of Volume 6, they kind of uh, fixed that. But, um... Ruby says that she hopes everyone's doing all right. Notice she doesn't just, she doesn't say Yang and the other. She says everyone. Um, and Blake says, if you're worried about Yang, you could always try calling her. Now, some have noticed, some have pointed out, and I listened back to this part, and I had Jess listen to it too, and it sounds like Blake's voice kind of cracks a little bit when she says Yang's name. Now, is that on purpose? Did Aaron's voice just crack a little bit when she delivered the voice and they, they liked it, they wanted to keep it that way? I don't know. But Blake could easily call Yang herself if she wanted to check up on Yang. But remember, Blake's story this volume is balance. She's in the middle I think what she's doing here is, for one, yes, she wants to check up on Yang. She's worried about Yang. But she trusts her. She's not well, yeah. going to just call in for well, everything. Well, the biggest reason why she's doing this is because they're starting, I think, to put Blake in the role as another big sister to Ruby. Because if she's going to be in a romantic relationship with Yang, she is going to be like a sister figure to Ruby. She's trying very subtly to try and patch things up between Ruby and Yang. So instead of Blake calling her, she suggests Ruby do it, just so they could have that communication. But also it would fulfill Blake's need to hear from Yang, hear that Yang's all right, you know. And um, I think that's what, what they're doing here. And I have been wanting them to do that since Volume 6. Ever since Bumblebee was pretty much established that, the, yeah, that's the way they were going to go in Volume 6, I've wanted more Ruby and Blake interaction because so they could start building a more sisterly bond. And it looks like they're doing that here. They've, we've had way more Blake and Ruby interactions this volume than the whole series combined. Yeah, well, another thing also, in, in addition to that, they're also building more of a closeness of their team, like the family within their team itself too, mm -hmm. which is something that's been needed because in the beginning, yeah, they were a team and they were functioning and they all functioned pretty well, but now they're building it more. Yeah. Like it's just, it's something that's been needed and I have something that I'm liking, you know, seeing. Now Ruby shows that she has been trying to call Yang, but here's the thing. Yang, Jean and Ren are so far out of mantle they're out of reach. They are out in the middle of practically nowhere. They went so far out, and now they have no ride because the box are screwed. Until Yang can do something. Yeah, well, which we get to. But um, they're too far out. She can't reach her. Because um, right after this, this is the only time we get to see Ruby and them, but it's good to see we, we checked up on them, at least. Um, and we know where they are now. So here we see some nuts and bolts. <laughs> nuts and bolts. <laughs> nuts and bolts, hey, it, it's happening. <laughs> um, and Yang starts picking them up. I love how they're further illustrating that um, Yang's outfit doesn't just look like a mechanic outfit in a way. She literally <laughs> is like a, a mechanic, um, which is good. It shows that, you know, we were shown early in the series that Ruby is very... Hand, like very capable of like making weapons and working on weapons because she made Crescent Rose. Well, it shows that it runs in the family, that Yang is a very capable mechanic because she had her own bike for so I long. Think she, I think, like, though we don't know a ton about Ty, yeah. 
but they probably learned a lot well, from him, though. Ty comes off as a jack of all trades in a way, because not all a little bit of everything. Yeah, because <laughs> not only is he a single father, he's a teacher. He, I'm more than you know. He taught Yang how to fight. He he does the garden. He does. He probably does a lot of housework. Plus, he's so, got. And why? Like that is very talented, apparently too. <laughs> a dog trainer, maybe. But um, but in the scene, we learned that yeah, they have no service. They're too far out. Um, so Yang, I think, is gathering all this because you know they only have one bike left and it's broken. So she's gonna have to try and fix it. Um. So yeah, they have no tra- and they have no transport back. So what? What option do they have? They start walking. Now, here's very interesting, okay? Their auras are low. Ren's lower than theirs because Ren got bounced off those rocks. I thought rocks. the rest of theirs started turning red. I, it might have. I just I just can't catch it right here. But I think or that or they're flashing. Um, so, yeah, all three of them are not in good shape. They're in the middle of nowhere. They've got no transport, and the cold is lowering their auras even more. They were already more than likely low, um, especially Ren and Yang's after dealing with the Hound, but now they're even lower, probably, and they're going lower. And Y said in Volume 7, without your aura, the cold out there would kill you very quickly. So Well, the cold also does lower... Well, well okay. yes, it is. Yeah. They are all going red. Yeah. But the cold will... Think of it this way. Yeah, it's a different concept, but anyone that... It's kind of common sense, really. A battery. Yeah. You leave a battery in a cold and don't touch it, or don't... You know, if it's already low, it's going to completely kill it. Yeah. And this... Not just car batteries. This goes for anything. But it's the same... It's the same concept. Since their auras... It would have been starting to lower anyways, but since it's so low, it's going to deplete it faster. Because they are losing what's keeping them warm. Yep. So Yang says, you know, they gotta find shelter before their auras are gone. And apparently Ren stated off-screen that he saw an outpost while he was sailing through the air. Now, as we can see, Ren's not happy. And, you know... Yang asks him, you know, you know, how much longer? He says he don't, he doesn't know. And Ren, and John, and Yang notice that Ren's acting very strange. Um, and she's like, you know, I thought you said you saw it while you're up in the air. He said he did, but it was right before he had to cut himself loose to help her and John. And it's funny, Yang says he's brought that up a couple of times now. At first, I was almost like. Does he regret having to save them? You know, it's like maybe because if he hadn't, maybe he could have gotten to Oscar. I don't know. I think he like he's torn. Like he yep. regrets it, but he also doesn't because he would have been he would have lost them. Like then yep. he'd be on his own. And Yang, you know, asks him, you know, is there something you want to say? And he says, not really. Wouldn't want to waste any more time. And finally. Now, this right here, this walking animation was so smooth. And I don't know, like, it just seemed like the animation in this episode was really, really well done. So Yang finally confronts him. You know, she just, you know, everyone has kind of been putting up with Ren's attitude from Volume 7 to, to now. Yang's not that type of character. She, no, She's going to be like, you know, <laughs> yeah, she is over it by this time. She's like, what's your deal? And, you know, he says, don't worry about it. And she says, well, I'm sorry things aren't going smoothly enough. Jean tries to c- calm it down. But an argument does ensue, saying things aren't going smoothly. Yang states that's part of being a huntsman. And Ren says, you know, we don't know the first thing about being huntsman. Pretty much, Ren thinks that they're still nowhere ready to be huntsmen and huntresses. Which, I'm starting to wonder, like, how much experience do you need to be a qualified huntsman? Because really... It seems like sometimes that huntsmen and hunt- and huntresses are nothing more than like mercenaries in a way. Like they take jobs and to to clear grim and other problems. So it just doesn't seem like that would be. He's too I don't focused know. on the technical aspect of it. Like okay, well we weren't ready. We didn't finish all of this to do, to become this. There's the thing, and I know I have said this in the past of videos. Um, and this goes with anything, even in real life. 
Yeah, you can learn so much from, you know, books or, um, training, um, like, hands-on stuff in within school but and nothing, setting. But no, nothing's better than real-world experience. Real-world experience. And the thing is, is, do you think, he's, he's so, his mindset is so on the technical side of things, he's not thinking, okay, well, think of other huntsmen. No one's perfect. Well, also, Nothing's going to go right, but... Well, also, they're dealing with a situation here that probably a normal huntsman or huntress wouldn't experience. Well, he's making it sound like it's it's all on them. It's just them. No, well, there's this... other huntsmen out there doing other things yeah, like, but... at other points. Like Yeah, but this current situation they're in, it is all he, up to no, them. No, he's talking like everything is their fault mm-hmm. like now. Like, everything is based off of them, and he's not looking at the big picture that they're, the other huntsmen are out defending other breaks in the wall or other grim invasions like there's it's not like it's not going to go smoothly like he's he's taking on too much yeah so to prove him wrong yang brings up you know haven from volume five the leviathan in volume six uh bringing the lamp to atlas in volume seven but ren just says you know we lost but then we lost it and but said, that's not and, their fault. There's yeah. somebody else was there intervening. Like so, it's not. It wasn't their fault. It's gone. Yeah, and he says, you know, every single <laughs> decision they've made since then has been wrong. Um, and it, it's just like, yeah, you know, like Yang says, you know, yeah, things haven't went, you know, right, but things could have been worse. And you know, he says, how could it be worse? They're stuck out there while Salem has the lamp and has Oscar. And uh, she brings up that, that they've got Penny on their side. And, you know, but he's, he's saying, like, well, you know, we're keeping her from Ironwood um, just so they can't get to the vault. And that's just trapping the whole city for Salem. Like, the the, uh, the city is a sitting duck right now. People are going to, get, to, die, to die because of us. But, I mean... That really happens in any kind of adventure epic. The the heroes usually always screw up at some point, and it causes people to die. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's a part of storytelling, it seems. If everything went right, it'd be too perfect. The, the characters would all be called Mary Sue's, and... But this is my point, is that he's just classifying that everything is all on just their two teams. Like, he's not factoring in that he's just taking it all on because of Ironwood. Yeah. It's, I think that all of this also, in addition to what he was already worried about, it's all because of Ironwood just piling into his mind. And it's just, which leads to all of this right now. Yeah, and Yang makes a good point, you know, do you think Atlas is just going to be able to float to safety now that she's there at the kingdom? Um but he says these aren't the decisions they should be making because they have no idea what they're doing. Um, John once again tries to, you know, tell him to cut it out, and he he says he's saying what everybody else doesn't want doesn't want to admit that they're way over their heads. He brings up that Ruby is barely more than a kid; he's just an orphan. What I love about right here is even though that he is advancing on Yang, and he's just unloading yang's standing there like she doesn't give two craps what he what like you know she's not having it you know she's, she's probably just like yeah okay vent get it out well, yeah this this is getting cool. i made a joke on twitter she's like cool story bro do you even lift because <laughs> i i don't think ren would ever try anything but if he did she'd put him in the ground um and then Jean once again tries to intervene, and Ren says the one of the lowest things he could have said. He flat out looks at Jean and says, "You cheated your way into Beacon." And boy, I don't, I, know, I don't know if you could catch it, but the look on his face almost instantly well, after he said it. Let's see if we can catch it. Yeah, yeah like yeah, he instant. knows. He, he goes, "I he, I shouldn't have said that." Yeah. Now, at first, I was worried he was going to say something about Pira. Like, you know, if you hadn't made the right, wrong decisions, we'd still be a full team or something. Like, no, let's but not go there. at least it shows that he's not, that's not something that he's been holding inside. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just, Pira decided that on her own. Yeah, but like, but does this mean that he's been holding that 
against Jean this whole time? I think that's just it's all the stress boiling up, so absolutely any thought in his mind is going to come up. And so, of course, that does upset Jean, because that was a pretty big revelation in Volume 1. I love these callbacks, callbacks to Volume 1. It's wild. Um, now, um, and John says, if you don't think we have it in us, fine. But he's getting out of the cold, and he just walks away. Well, we still have a job to do. Yeah, we still got a job. And then Yang says, seriously, is your goal just to push everyone away? I'm sure, I'm sure some people are going to think that was cold. In this situation, with the he way... He needed to hear it. Yeah, because he, he's, he's going doing. too far. But I was like, massive <laughs> burn, Yang. And I was like, get it, burn. <laughs> but this is something like... And I know, even in the last volume and up to now... Everything that I've been saying between the split of them and all that. That's something he needed to hear that. Yeah. Like, that's what he's been doing because he's... We know that he, with his semblance and all that, you know, masking emotion and all that, he doesn't know how... He still doesn't seem to have a grasp on how to, to handle it. Yeah. So, him not... With what Nora said... Um, was that the last one or not? Can I the episode about what she said if it was her fault. I have no idea. <laughs> well, um, I'm just making sure that I'm not saying something that's <laughs> not been seen yet. That was in chapter three. Okay, that's I already that. out. <laughs> well, anyways, um, she had said, you don't know if it's his fault or mine. Well, I'm kind of leaning more towards its Ren side because he's not, he's not letting out the emotion he needs to. The communication, that's that's where things were headed, and that's why I think... I knew he'd snap at some point, but mm -hmm. he just... He needs to see that. Now, probably for the most uncomfortable moment of the volume so far, and maybe in all of Ruby, like, who? Like, usually... I'm a stone wall. I'm usually okay with anything. This was a little much. So, for one, Ospin giving the biggest lie he has ever told... Oscar, don't panic. We're going to be okay. Well, the thing is, is we also don't know. Uh, like, Austin may have a plan for this, for something like this that would happen. Yeah, happened. but don't tell him we're going to be okay when what's about to happen is going to well, happen. I know, I know that, but you get what I'm saying. Like, just. Austin's probably trying to think of. <laughs> on along the lines of what to do to get them out of this. So, yeah. Um, Oscar's uh, in the abyss right now in Salem, my long lost Ozma. Oh, boy. Um, boy, I'm sorry. She is so scary right here, but she is also still hot. <laughs> she really is. Like, it's hard for me to hate a villain that's as gorgeous as Salem can be. But, um... Uh, this Even her character is touched up a lot from the past. Yeah, like, I noticed she looked a little bit different in here in this episode. Like, she looked way more animated, in a way. Because look at that. She just... Anyway, and the, the hound is sitting there like a perfectly good boy. Like, <laughs> look what I brought you. Can I get a a pat on my head, a treat? That's what he looks like. I know. <laughs> look at that thing. Um. So I have. This was one thing I was most ex uh, excited about: Salem's and Ozpin reuniting, and because I've still got this lingering feeling that they still love each other somehow. Who but knows? Salem's like, pushed that so far aside. Yeah. And. Which is kind of what's led her to where she's at now. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting there. Just here. He looks <laughs> lankier than he did in the last. Like, maybe it's a, the form he's that He's not it's leaning taken. down. He's sitting. Because yeah. he's, he's sitting up. But yeah, he's like, I'm a good boy. Look at what I brought you. Ugh. It's been how many years since we last saw each other? Face to face. This is, and now so here Oscar tries to give his best Ozpin impersonation, like because he does kind of sound like what he does when Ozpin takes over. You know, sorry that it doesn't meet your expectations, which she can see through. She grabs a hold of him, like you, you know, don't, don't, don't try me. You know, he learns very fast. Don't you dare try me. I may have a pretty face, but well. <laughs> She would have, uh, yeah, not that, okay. <laughs> Says you're not fully him, not yet. Anyway, like, everybody keeps on reminding this poor boy that he is one day not going to be himself. That's, you gotta quit doing that. That's heartbreaking. Um, 
but she softens up. I, I'm sorry, I can't hate Salem because I know her backstory. So it's just like, like even like her features, even her face, anything. It's not so. They're not as harsh as they've yeah. been in the past. So you can tell when you tell there's been an animation like touch up with her, which I mean is needed. Cause, I mean, she's not, besides, like, all the lines and being all pale, <laughs> she's not bad looking. No, like, she's not. But, like, it's, That's what I'm saying. They've touched uh, it up. I wish they had maybe waited a little bit longer to give us her backstory, because it's, it's hard to hate a villain who you know their backstory to, and it's, su- it's a backstory that you really sympathize with them for. Like... I don't know, I just can't dislike Salem just because her backstory is so tragic. And it's the the two gods' fault. Well, I mean, yeah, you shouldn't mess with the natural order, but, I mean, they could have been less jerks about it. Yeah, that's where it started, but then her own self is what's oh, yeah. created I everything mean, yeah. else. Yeah, like, she she's, definitely, she's definitely not innocent. Because she's, uh, she's had a way to come back, but instead she, and she just did, wanted to... She did manipulate the, situ- the, the situation as well, but I don't know. I just can't seem to not sympathize with her a little bit. But anyway, she, tr- she asked Oscar about the relic underneath the beacon, which... We've not heard about in a while. Like this is the first time in a while they've brought up the relic of beacon because nobody knows where it is. Um, Wait, beneath the school? Well, are we? Are we sure we're talking about beacon? Or are we? Yeah. Sure talking about Atlas? No, she was talking about beacon. She says beacon. Oh. Um, and this, I'm sorry. This, she seems seductive in a way. She's trying to draw him out. Yeah. Which. I, it's it, it's working. <laughs> but uh, if you know, if I know my Ozma, he has used some means of deception. Pretty much, she wants to know where that relic is. Which, of course, even Oscar doesn't know. Yeah, look at her. She's being all sweet and giving these soft looks, and she gives the hound a little scratch. <laughs> and he says he doesn't know, which she agrees that he probably would keep that one guarded, even from uh, Oscar. Um. So then she asks about the password for the lamp, which we all know is Jen's name. So I wonder if she's going to be pissed that there's only one question left. Because in episode one, she said, I have questions, plural, for you, but she's only going to have one. I kind of hope she doesn't get that chance, though. I don't think she's going to, but... No, but I mean, I'm just hoping, like, it'll be too late. Something... I wonder... What if somehow Cinder is still the one that screws her over with having it? I don't know. I still think it's going to be Emerald because she's supposed to be Aladdin. <laughs> I think she's going to somehow well, accidentally Cinder, do it. Well, that's like the whole situation because Cinder and Emerald, they kind of yeah. went together. So that's what well, I'm thinking. We've not yeah. got to that yet. No, I meant in general. <laughs> um. So Oscar tells her, the lamp is all out of questions, which is a bald-faced lie. Um, there is one question <laughs> left. Um, makes you wish she kind of had to use that last question already. But it's it's a uh, plot thing, so of course they're going to save it for later. Um, but sadly for Oscar, Sal- Salem sees right through it, and uh, yeah, we get some torture. Such nice colors, too bad... They look like they don't that feel good. That back to her flashback. Yeah. So in this moment, Oscar's eyes flash to when he switches between him and Ospin. So, and remember, his aura is gone. So he is feeling all of this, and Ospin more than likely is too. So, uh, this not a and the, the hound just <laughs> sitting there, just like he like it's an everyday thing. Like, man, this, I this, I really want a milk bone biscuit right now. <laughs> this is further pushing the things that I've said so far about this thing. Yeah. Um, and look, Which she, further pushes it than we go further in. She, let's see if I can get this shot. The animation here. This animation right here is so... It's just awesome. Like, every volume, the animation gets better. Um, it doesn't last long, but I'm sure it didn't feel good. The lies come out of you so easily... And she caresses his face. Salem, you do know this is a kid, right? 
she's she's trying to give him a false sense of security here. Like minded souls indeed. I do really like this image that's of what, Salem. This is actually the image that I was th- picturing when I said that they she really looks, touched the image. She looks a bit more like her hum like what really is Salem now? Is she like half grim or something at this point? Like I don't want to say she's not human, but I mean, I don't know. But she looks more like she used to here, in a way. The way how softly she's looking at him, but... And she's using that. Yeah. But my point was is how how nice that looks compared to past times we've seen her. It's so touched up and so detailed now. But she's trying to use it to her advantage. Yeah. She says either... Clearly it's not working. (laughs) She said either through Ozma or Oscar, she's going to have the relic. And this... See, the torture from Salem didn't, for some reason, didn't bother me as bad as this part right here did. She opens the door, and there is Hazel. And we all know Hazel's hatred for Ospen. And he starts beating the crap out of Oscar. Hazel. Hazel's so focused on what he thinks happened with his sister. But I'm sorry. Right now, he's not Ospen. You are beating up a defenseless child, dude. Like, you are beating up a kid. (sighs) Originally, I had sympathy for Hazel. I hope this comes back to bite him. Hazel's on my shit list. Uh, He needs to get, get, like, beat up for this. I do hope we hear more of the next one, because it sounds like, like I said, obviously, Ozpin's... He, he's dealt with being in pres- her presence. It's obviously been a long time, but... The point is, he's letting a little a kid be beaten by a man that looks like that. He needs to think quick <laughs> on what, what he needs to do next to help this. I don't care. Like, I'd be at this point, I don't care if Oscar gets mad. I'm taking over. Because this, like, I should be, I should go through this, not him. Yeah. Which, that might happen. We yeah. just, we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. So, thankfully, we don't see any more. So... Here she's walking with her puppy dog. And this, this again, further yep. pushes what I've said. And here is Cinder in the very lovely Neo, looking lovely as always. I'm surprised Neo is still around. She looks like she's bored. In a she, way. I, she wants to leave. <laughs> yeah. So, so here, here's the thing. Even Cinder is what put is off. that? <laughs> yeah, she is put off by this thing. And, like, normally, to me, at a first glance, it doesn't look any different than a normal Grim. Really, it's a Grim dog, but I there think is... it must give something off, too. Like Maybe. That's... And she says it's an experiment, and she's so far pleased with results. And she gives a little scratch right, behind its ear, and it does the dog things. Like, okay, in Chapter 3, this thing was terrifying. Now they're trying to make it look cute. Like, you are really tugging at the heartstrings of dog lovers here because it's like oh i want to pet it oh my god it'll it'll do all that like <laughs> uh, like what are you doing here she asked her do you want something and cinder once again wants to go after penny like she is obsessed at this point well i mean we already knew she was she, obsessed yeah. but yeah. It, it's like really you you're still beating that dead horse and here's the thing Salem says, do you hear that, my pet? She thinks, she she wants, she says it in a way like she is looking down on Cinder so much. She thinks her needs and all that are pathetic in a way. You can hear it in her voice. And this whole, th- like, and, you know, she thinks, um, let's see, what exactly... As if she's done something that warrants me caring about either of those things. Like, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want. It's all about what Salem wants. Yeah. And (gasps) Cinder doesn't make a point. We're just sitting and waiting. That is something that Salem has done all series long. So she is used to that. She's like, don't you question my stay-at-home rules, you know? Um, You know, without the maiden power, the vault means nothing, which that is true. And she says, let me claim it for you. Um, And Salem tells her, I'll tell you when and where you are needed. Right now, you're keeping your ass here, pretty much. Um, And Cinder, like, you know, is like, but. But then this freaking thing, like, 
goes feral on her. And I'm wondering either it's just reacting like, you know, a guard dog would, or if this thing is channeling how Salem is feeling. And, like, it's letting out... It could be a bit of both. And the thing is, is it's... Which would initiate the it to act as a guard dog to her. Like, anybody speaks up against her, it will <laughs> warn. I love Neo still standing back there with her arms crossed. She ain't moved a bit, <laughs> one bit. Um, she says, I'd like to think I have shown a great deal of patience, you know, after how long she's been alive. Um... But I do hate repeating myself, which she has stated in the past. I hate repeating myself, uh, so I'm I kind of I kind of uh, agree with Salem on that. And she says, "You will remain here." Is that clear? And you know, she says, "Yes, of course." And she repeats, "Without you, I am nothing." And it's like, send her to Salem. It seems like is lower than a dog, because this dog is like above Cinder right now. Like, this thing has taken its place beside Salem and Cinder... She's given everybody, like, that's she's that works for her, like, especially Cinder, like, this false sense of, well, you will help me create and we will do great things. Yeah. And then once you're done and she'll just set you aside until she needs you for something. And I'm... And tells you what that is. And I'm starting to think in Cinder's, <clears throat> in Cinder's story, Salem may be in a way, a twisted uh, fairy godmother, but she also may be the wicked stepmother as well. But um, who knows? We'll have to see how things go. But yeah, Cinder I'm, lost to I a have dog. Point on that once we get to. But yeah, Cinder lost to a dog. <laughs> Pretty much. So you know, Neo's like, well, now what? You know, I can't believe she's still following Cinder at this point. So right here, she says, you know, okay, so this is interesting. I know what she said, and she, but Neo doesn't talk. So what what happened here? You know, it's almost like Neo just got done telling her something. She's like, I know what she said. So what's going on here? Okay. This was what I was, I couldn't remember if it was right after or not. Um, This is what I was meaning, referring to when you had mentioned about the wicked stepmother and all that. Like. She's. Well, we'll be back before anyone notice. Yeah, she's sneaking. Cinderella. Yeah, she's sneaking she off for the ball. Off to the ball. Yeah. And comes back. Yeah. But okay, there's, there's other versions of Cinderella. Like, um, one of my favorites is called Ever After. Mm -hmm. She's caught. Yeah. Afterwards, like when she comes home after her night, she comes back and you know, but in that one, she was actually caught at the ball. So. It's it's kind of to me leaning towards that those versions of the story that she's gonna sneak off she'll be fine at first and then something's gonna happen. Anyway, um, Neo still showing not approving looks when it comes to Cinder, and then she does this little Mary Poppins like thing. <laughs> I love Neo so much, and you know, um, Cinder says she wants to see what's going on with Amity, so. She's directly wanting to go where Penny is. Because Penny went back to Amity where Pietro and Maria are. So, that's not good. Um, so, here we get this scene from the trailer. So, we have officially seen every moment from the trailer. So, yeah, we are definitely in uh, unknown waters at this point. Um, she says that Salem doesn't know these kids like... Cinder does. She Cinder knows by now that Ruby and them are not going to give up. And she looks back at Neo, and Neo's like, "Nah, I don't know if I want to <laughs> do this." Yeah, and you know she growls or grunts, and then Emerald just shows up out of nowhere. She means she was following. Yeah, probably. yeah, pretty much. And I'm sorry, Emerald. So, oh, I want to go. You know, I'll, I'll go with you. I mean, I'm sorry. It's so kiss up like. It's like she Emerald. wants to be accepted, but yeah. she's not seeing that's just... She says she's been working on her semblance, so I wonder if Emerald has evolved hers. Neo just... She's sick of everybody right now. Look, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be all three of them. I think Neo will go. But, um... She says, I can help. And it's just like... Yeah, look. Look, look at this glare that Neo is giving her. It's either... 
Neo's just annoyed, or maybe she was gonna go, and this was her chance to get Cinder alone and double cross her yeah. again. But now here, Emerald showed up uh, and ruined her plans. Who knows? That's just a theory. Neo um, could, even if Emerald were to go, Neo could still ruin everything. And of course, Emerald is more f- faithful to Cinder than she is Salem. I think, even though she's probably scared of Salem, she says, "I won't tell anybody." Which Cinder's like, you know, how much did you hear? You know, and that's yeah, that's pretty much saying, okay, well now I'm gonna have to let you go because you, how much did you hear now? Yeah. So here we see that Yang, Jean, and Ren did find a little outpost for the night. So this means, depending on how Chapter Five goes, this is the end of Day One, and we're only four episodes in because you know this was supposed to, it's supposed to take a course over 48 hours now next episode might be the same night who knows who knows the how same long night into can, the next day yeah who knows how long they can pad it out <laughs> um so we see that, that you know it does have a heater so they'll stay warm and you know john says you know ren you're right i did cheat into beacon fake transcripts baby <laughs> and um says, I'm glad I had people around me to help me see that I was bigger than that mistake. And that's like, oh, Pyrrha was one of them. Pyrrha was probably the most, the biggest one that did. Um, Ruby did too. Ruby did too. What? What about it? Just, I don't know if it would end up meaning something. Well, I mean, it's an, it's an SCD I know, but that could be used. Yeah. I don't know. But, yeah, it's... For them to see, yeah, he knows that he what he did was wrong, but look where he's at now. Yep. He he didn't think he could be anything. That's why he cheated his way in. Yep. But really, he is he is worth a lot. He's and, come a long way. And then he states, you know, mm-hmm. you, you don't have to force yourself to be strong. The more you hide from what you're feeling, the more alone you're going to feel. And trust me. And it does look like Ren is considering what he says. Ren doesn't exactly look mad here. Um... But he does turn around and leave. Yang's like, if anyone cares, found the part to fix the bike. Like, you know, I'm just trying to uplift the mood here. So, oh. yay. Okay, Good so news. Yay. <laughs> so, Ren goes out and sets in the snow. That's, are you not cold? <laughs> like, his ass is going to be numb <laughs> if he stays out there too long. Um, You know, and Yang says, you know, for what's worth, I'm sorry he said that. Um, I know you've had to work hard to get here, Jean. Like, boy, yeah, he did. Poor Jean, he had, well, he got his ass busted several times. Nothing. Yeah, and then he says, you know, it's stress. Um, I used to push people away too, and it's like, uh, oh, he pushed away Pira a few, like you know, when she. But tried, I'm sure that's mm. not the only person. I know, like he's but done that too either. I know, but I mean, come on, let's face it. That's what they're trying to drive yeah, I know. to. <laughs> Um, so yeah, mechanic Yang going at it, you know, she's okay. So here is not, not the biggest moment of the episode. Cause let's, and, you know, the show is more than shipping, but the biggest shipping moment of the episode. Okay. So before we get into it, let me remind you all the part that she found is purple. It's Purple. What character associates with purple? Okay. I, they're lucky there was a wrench in that place because I don't know. I don't know how she. Maybe she could have used her her arm to do it because I'm sure it's got a strong. Okay. Never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. And she says, "Do you think she thinks less of me for not helping out with Amity, John? Trying to be the good guy that he is, says Ruby is your sister." She's always going to love you, no matter, you know, if you disagree. And she goes, yeah, Ruby. Okay, people. I am going to spell it out for you. She is talking about Blake. She is not talking about Ruby. You want to know how we're supposed to know? Well, for one, when you state something like, hey... Um, do you think, let's say you got into 
an argument with a friend, but your significant other was there, and they kind of went off with your friend to, to calm them down because they started, you know, crying or something. And you're like, you know, do you think they think bad of me now? And if Jess was like, or not you, but you'd be the significant other <laughs> somewhere. And they'd be like, oh, so and so, you know, you and so and so are good, blah, blah, blah. And all that. I was like, yeah, that's who I was talking about. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations. Okay, she is not talking about Ruby. She's talking about Blake. That's why they put in the whole, yeah, Ruby. That's what I was talking about. And you can even look on Yang's face. When, like, she turns a little bit more to John, and she's like, that's that's not what I was talking about, but thanks okay. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Now... To the low part of the fandom who are using this as a sign that Yang does not care about Ruby. I know most of you are just trolls who are just trying to get attention and start stuff. But if you literally think this means Yang doesn't care about Ruby. You either don't have a sibling or you just hate Bumblebee and you hate every single time. Or you've time. never been around somebody with siblings. That or you just hate Bumblebee and you hate when they actually give it build up the you want to know that here pretty much yes yang still cares about ruby and you know why john says it right here ruby is your sister she's always going to love you even if you disagree why said it in chapter three they're sisters they're always going to care about each, each other, even if they look at things differently. They have had two characters in universe who have siblings. Weiss has a brother and a sister. Jean has... Sisters. Yeah, <laughs> a bunch of sisters, okay? They would know, I have a sister. I have a brother. I care way more about what Jess thinks of me than I care what my brother or sister think. Because you know why? They're family. They're going to love me no matter what. It's called unconditional love. Are there some sibling relationships out there that are not like that? Of course, you know. But... I mean, I have a sister. I have disagreed with my brother and sister so many times. We've had shouting matches. We've insulted each other. We've even gotten physical with each other. Does that mean I love my brother and sister any less? No, it does not. Now, me and Jess are engaged. We kind of are in the whole unconditional love stage. But if me and Jess had just started dating, she has no, she, she has no commitment to always love me. Like, it, you know what I mean, too. Yes. And, like, and here's the thing. Yang is worried that Blake is going to think different of her because she didn't offer to help with Amity. Well, she chose not to help with Amity, and Blake did. And that's because it's going all the way back to Yang's abandonment issues, but I don't think it it has anything to do with her being scared of losing Blake again because of how she's acting. I think it could be, you know, it could be like, you know, Raven left Ty. You know, why Why would Yang not think that Blake might leave her one day, you know? Um, and like you, your parents got a divorce. Were you ever scared that... a couple divorces. Yeah, so did, that, did their divorces ever affect your thoughts on how your relationships would go? Maybe in the beginning, yeah. Things like it's it's just something that's always there, and it's even if you you know that's not gonna happen, you're not the, you're not gonna let that happen. It's still something you've lived through. I mean, well, my point is pretty it's much not going to. Well, my point is, a person who's never seen who didn't go through a parent divorce would think more maybe positive on some relationships than a a person who saw their parents go through a divorce and went through stuff yeah, like that. Like it's So yeah, it does kind of tie back to the aban abandonment issues, but I think Yang is overthinking a little bit. It, and it's part of the character arc that she's going through right now. Because we, as the audience, know Blake's not thinking any less of her. She's worried about her. She misses her. So 
I'm going to tell y'all right now. I'm not going to say there's going to be a kiss this volume. But they're building towards something. The reunion is going... There's something going to happen. If they don't... We're doing a ranting video. Because that... I'm, I'm sure we won't be the only Yeah, because I'm sorry. They're building something here. We have had Bumblebee build up every single chapter so far now. We've had connections to Renora all volume long. Both of them are definitely thinking of each other. They miss each other. Yang is worried that Blake is going to think less of her now. Blake's just all out worried, but she's also trying to patch the relationship between Ruby and Yang up because she's a good girlfriend slash future sister-in-law. But, um, yeah, if, if the reunion, like, I'm not expecting a kiss yet. If it happens, great, you know, but I'm expecting something, a hug, a romantic moment, a romantic moment, you know, something, um, but yes, this, all you Bumblebee haters out there and you shipping and the people who hate shipping, I'm sorry. This is more than a shipping moment. This is a, this is a, this is a Bumblebee moment. This is Yang thinking about Blake and worried that the decision she made is going to negatively affect Blake's opinion of her. I mean, it's that simple. And her saying, yeah, Ruby, that means... I wasn't talking about my sister. I know my sister is going to love me no matter what. We had a fight. We had a falling out. It can be fixed. Because Ruby's not going to hold that against her. Ruby's already been trying to call her. Okay, so enough about that. Um, yeah, see, even if you disagree with each other. Um, yeah, Ruby. That's who I was talking about. So <laughs> I've got to throw some shad at John here. I said it on Twitter. He failed to realize Pyrrha had feelings for him until it was too late. He couldn't read the room in Volume 7 when he complimented Nora on her outfit. You know, I like your outfit too. And he misinterpreted this moment. John, my friend, <laughs> I love you to death. You're zero for three when it comes to picking up on romance, dude. We've all known somebody that's like this, though. Yeah. <laughs> We have. Like, there's um, always that one. One like, friend who's yes. just like, who can't read the room. And then when he finds out you're dating, he's like, well, when did that happen? You know? <laughs> so but maybe he, John, maybe John does get it right here. And he's like, oh, maybe I read that wrong, you know? But I mean, it's just, it's just, that's how I, you know, that's just John. Like, that's adds to the, like, with the clumsiness and all that. That's yep. just John. So John <laughs> says he needs to get some sleep. Uh, but he can't stop thinking about Oscar. Huh? You don't want to know what poor Oscar's going through right now. Your big brother mode would really kick in. Uh, Yang tells him to, to go ahead. I don't know why it says brute, because she says brood. But she says, you know, I'll make sure Ren doesn't br uh, brood himself to death in the cold. Uh, John says, thanks, I have a bad feeling. Well... Things always seem to get worse before they get better. It's always darkest before dawn. So that's been the theme of this whole entire volume. Well, the one thing with, with John saying, I have a bad feeling. Well, we quickly learn why. Well, <laughs> first off, I've seen some some people have said that it looks like Ren has something in his hand, hand and like it's, um, it is, um, Alluding to the intro where he has the pedal in his hand. It's, I think, yeah, it's snow. It's snow. But it, it, it might be a little thing. But yeah, have a bad feeling. We zoom out over to the frozen lake over here. There's and, your bad feeling. Yep, and crack. the ice cracks. <laughs> so, for one, we've got, those three are experiencing some negative emotions. So, there's that. What grim is this going to be? Personally, I think this is going to be the grim that... Um, won that art contest. Um, was it not? Was it not an aquatic grim? So. I think it was like a fish. I think it may have been. I'm, it's been a while. I don't remember. So I think that's what this is going to be. Um, and with that, the episode ends. So a lot going on in this in this uh, chapter. So I think we'll either get the reuniting next week or the week after that. Because I could see them padding stuff out 
next week. Um, Because what I think is going to happen is since Ruby and them cannot get a hold of Yang and them, they're going to like contact maybe the Happy Huntresses, maybe May will uh, contact Fiona and say, you know, hey, where where are they at? And they're like, I don't know. They said they had an emergency and they went out of the city. Um, And then, you know, once uh, they get closer into range or close, because maybe the reason why they've not seen it. They're too far out, like... Well, yeah, like maybe the reason why they can't see Jean Ren and Yang's auras are down is because they're just too far out. Well, think back but, to six. Well, yeah, but um, I just didn't know if the aura level thing would also be like be able to go out of signal. But I guess if you you're so out of signal that you can't call them, that maybe you can't pick them up. But um, once they start getting closer, they're going to see that their auras are low, and then that's going to cause panic. This Grim is obviously going to attack. Yeah. Um. And with Ren, Nora, and Jean having their auras low, I don't think things are going to be going very well. And we know Aaron has said that she had to scream during this volume. I'm hoping <laughs> that they show up and everything's going bad and Blake screams Yang's name, maybe, because things are not going well. And then they, they finally conquer the Grimm and... You know, we might have a nice little hug or moment, you know. Will it happen? Probably not. Kruby's not... I've not been doing very well at guessing Kruby's uh, intentions this volume so far. We're still very early in the volume as well. I kind of think as far as, like, them, like, as a possibility is that, yeah, they'll contact them to find out where they were last like yeah. before they took off out of the city that way it would give them a direction because once they're in a spot where that they were in the city it would give them a direct boy blake's gonna a direction to go towards the wall blake's like, to get out blake's gonna be worried yeah and <laughs> it's like the thing is i think they'll probably be able to get a ship because the closer you get to someone the more it'll start showing how close you're getting to them. Yeah, like so hopefully... we've seen that several times through ruby like when in especially six but in five even when they finally got a hold of jean yeah but um yeah i mean is that is that how it'll happen i don't know i think next that's just a theory i think next week they'll probably make it suspenseful like of course they will the grim will show up and yang jean and ren will not be doing well and like the episode will end with ruby and them trying to hurry there because let's face it they've all got fret like they're way in better shape i mean Nora's not in good shape but blake weiss and ruby are all right her being able to rest at least put her in better shape to be able to be moving again but um, I don't see May going with them because I'm sure May will stay to watch over Nora, hopefully. Or maybe, on, who knows, Weiss might stay behind. I don't know. But um, no, Weiss would be pretty helpful. So maybe May will stay. I don't know. Or maybe Nora will be on her feet in time. And then Ren will see her in the shape she's in and be like, what happened? You know? Maybe it'll click something yeah, maybe. in that mind of his. Maybe. Maybe that's... Like, because obviously it would fit, though, because of his outburst. Like, yep. him suddenly snapping... Seeing Nora would probably put things into a little bit of a reality. Yeah. Who wrote this episode? I'll, I'm curious. I want to see who. Okay, so Eddie, Eddie. wrote this. <laughs> so, Eddie, thank you for uh, that little uh, breadcrumb that you threw in there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, great episode. Great animation. Great new song. Um, some nice Robin and Crow banter. I like the artwork. Oh, yeah. Um, the Oscar stuff was hard to set through, really. Um, the, the You know, it was nice to touch base with Ruby Ruby's group, if only for a little bit. But this was mostly a Jean, Yang, and Ren episode. Um, a lot of tension, a lot of great action. Um, but things, once again, you know, are, are not looking good. Like, it seems like every episode, things are getting worse. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, a nice little more angsty bumblebee missing each other kind of stuff. So, we'll see what happens next week. Who knows? Um, hopefully, you know, next week will be a normal week. I won't be at work. So, we'll be able to watch it as <laughs> soon as it airs. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this analysis. It probably ran way longer than it should have, but there was a lot to cover for this episode. Um, 
If you enjoyed it, please hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, click that like button, leave us a comment, let us know your theories, let us know what you thought of the video. Any little bit helps, any kind of interaction with you guys helps the channel, but we also very, very much enjoy talking to you. As always, this is Kanan. This is Jesse. We are the Geeky Saiyan Couple. We love you all very, very much. Stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves. If it's if our if your weather is like ours right now, stay warm. And we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.